Hello, this is Philip Myers of PEME Consulting. Welcome to the first video tutorial on the strength of materials for tank engineers. The intent of this series of videos on strength of materials is to assist practicing tank and plant engineers who are not specialists in structural engineering to understand the fundamental principles related to working with steel tanks, piping, and pressure vessels. Specifically, we hope that this group of videos will help you better relate to the future series of tank video tutorials that we will be publishing soon by providing a sound background for these videos. To be more effective in your communications and knowledge of basic principles, be more effective at your job, and to understand the world around you a little bit better. We limit the dis topics discussed to tanks, piping, and pressure vessels, which are the staple equipment of oil, gas, and chemical plants. We will not address geotechnical engineering, structural steel design for structures which are not tanks, piping, or pressure vessels, or other specialty topics. We assume that you have taken a course in engineering statics sometime in your education, as this is a starting point for a good understanding of structurally related topics. For those wishing to go further into the structural field, they need to consider taking a suite of programs or courses in topics such as engineering mechanics, dynamics, theory of elasticity, fracture mechanics, theory of plates and shells, and so forth. We already talked a little bit about the intent of this series of videos on strength of materials. We'll cover terminology, difference between pressure and stress, the properties associated with stress versus force, Hooke's law and elasticity, and the concept of a stress element. In any discussion of engineering mechanics or strength of materials, understanding the terminology and jargon is important. The first word is homogeneous. That simply means that all of the elastic properties in an object or a solid are the same at every point within that object. Isotropic means that Direction does not affect those properties within the solid. This is in contrast to something like wood, which is anisotropic. Wood has grains, and so it's stronger in one direction than in a direction perpendicular to the grains. Orthotropic simply means isotropic in three mutually perpendicular directions. So this word is less important than the others. We're talking about steel in this series of videos, and the two most important points about steel are that it is homogeneous, it's the same throughout, and it's isotropic. None of its properties are different in one direction as opposed to another. So that we're all on the same page, here are some basic facts. Stress is defined as force per unit area. There are different kinds of stress, hydrostatic, normal, and shear. We'll cover all of these later. In the SI system, the basic unit of force is a newton. It's a kilogram meter per second squared. It's easy to remember because from Newton's law, F is equal to M, which is the kilograms, and A, which is in meters per second squared. Pressure is defined as force per unit area, so that would be a newton per meter square. That's a pascal, which is a kilogram meter per second squared divided by area. So by cancellation, we end up with the units of pressure, kilogram per meter second squared. In the USCS, we use the PSF, or pounds force per square foot. We'll also use PSI. PSI is defined as one pound force per square inch. That can easily be converted by multiplying by the square of 12 inches per foot, and that's 144 PSF. Here are some useful approximations converting between USCS and the SI system. One PSF is 47.9 Pascals. A PSF would be the weight of, say, a cookie pan of about a square foot. So a Pascal is a small unit since it would be about one-fiftieth of that cookie pan. A PSI is 68.95 Pascals. 
a more practical unit to work with is a kilopascal, but it is only 0.145 psi. Another unit to, that we work with often is the megapascal, 145 psi. And finally, atmospheric pressure is 14.7 psia absolute, and that's equivalent to 101 kilopascals. Pressure and stress have the same units, but they are not the same thing. Both are measured in force per unit area. Pressure is generally most relevant to gases or liquids because they don't have a direction associated with them. Stresses in solids, however, do have a direction associated with them. Stresses are usually dealing with the internal pressures within a solid and they can be represented in one dimension by sigma equals force per unit area. In one dimension we mean something that's long and thin like a rod and in tension the sign is positive. In compression the sign would be negative. So pressure can be stated without a direction. It's a scalar and for stress we can state it with a direction. There's a lot of informal jargon used in stress engineering so we'll clear up some of that. None of these are precise. They are, are more descriptive. If you need preciseness then you have to look at the context of the problem and understand all of the details. But compressive stresses are one kind of stress. We're all familiar with compression. If we squeeze a bar like this, it will be in compression and have compressive forces. The same is true for tension. So in a tensile test, we pull a bar and it is subject to tensile stresses. Shearing stresses are stresses that are normal to the object under consideration in the direction shown here. So shearing stresses tend to want to warp this object like this due to the shear that's developed. Torsion is fairly obvious. It is like the stresses that are created when you turn a pump shaft. It is a twisting motion. And then finally there's bending stress which is caused when you have a beam action, a force pressing on a beam that's supported at the end. So that's called bending. There are other kinds of stresses and we'll talk about those as we need to. But again, they tend to be uh, ill-defined and not very precise until you look at the specific details of the problem you're considering. One of the most fundamental principles in strength of materials is Hooke's Law. We're going to talk about it in the context of the 1D case. That's something like a rod or a rubber band where one dimension is significantly larger than the other two dimensions. If we pull a small amount, the rubber band will remain elastic. In other words, when you release it, it comes back to its original shape. On the other hand, if we pull too hard, as you know from experience, the rubber band will not return to its original shape. It will remain stretched or elongated. It has actually yielded. And if we pull hard enough, it will break. We can set up a coordinate system like this. We can have x in this direction and we'll set x equal to zero in the relaxed state. If we do that and within the elastic range we'll find that f is equal to kx. k is a proportionality constant. Basically what we're saying is that the force is proportional to the amount of stretch and within the elastic range the constant k remains a constant. Let's say that k is equal to 10 newtons per meter. And let's say that we stretch the rubber band one meter. We have the force is 10 newtons per meter. Meters cancel and of course we end up then with 10 newtons. 
Let's now say that we stretch the rubber band three meters and we're still within the elastic range. Then F equals 10 newtons per meter times three meters. We cancel the meters and end up with, we end up with 30 newtons. This is the spring equation and we can plot different materials. So this is a weak material because the slope is low. The slope represents the force required per unit stretch. A strong material is going to have a much steeper slope. Steel bars behave very much the same way. In this case we have tensile stresses here and in the opposite case where we push the bars from the ends as shown we would have compressive stresses. Now the basic equation that's used in strength of materials is sigma equals E epsilon. It's very much like the analogy of the spring equation. Sigma is the stress. E is Young's modulus. It's a constant of proportionality. For steel it's about 30 times 10 to the 6 psi or 30 million psi. Epsilon is a strain. It's the relative amount of elongation or shortening. It's shown here where we have delta L, which is the amount of stretch, and when we divide that by L0, we get the strain. It can be positive or negative. Positive if you are in a tensile state, and negative if you're in a compressive state. I want to introduce you to the concept of a stress element, or also called a stress cube, and the sign convention. Don't worry about other complexities that will arise. We'll address those later. The stress cube can be visualized as an infinitesimally small cube removed, extracted from a larger solid undergoing stress. A cube has six faces, and in this picture we have three visible faces. First, I want to define what a face is. A face is a plane, so for example, this is a X face because it is normal it's a plane perpendicular to the x-axis. It's the positive x-face because this face is facing the positive x-direction, which is that way. There's a corresponding negative face on the opposite side. This applies to all six faces. There are three normal stresses. A normal stress is perpendicular to the face. So for example, sigma x here is perpendicular to the x face. As far as sign convention goes, tensile force acting on this cube is positive, and a compressive force is negative. There are the six shearing stresses you can see here. Shearing stresses are identified by two subscripts. The first subscript, the symbol for shearing stress is tau. The first subscript, x, indicates the face. The second subscript indicates the direction. So for example, tau xy, we're on the x face here, and x is the x face that we've drawn in red and the y is the positive y direction. So shearing stress is positive when it is in the direction of the positive axis. One of the very useful and practical simplifications is to have a model where we're using plane stress. Many models in reality actually are adequately modeled by plane stress and that simply means that these three stresses are zero. Even though this stress square has some thickness, it has to in order to transmit force, which is sigma times this differential area, we consider only these two normal stresses and two shearing stresses. This simplification is applicable to equipment like pressure vessels, tanks, and piping. It's very useful when it can be applied, which is most of the time in an industrial setting. A few precautions are in order as we go forward. I want to point out that 
forces are something we're all familiar with. They have magnitude and direction and the rules of linear algebra, that is things like scalar multiplication of vectors and vector addition apply. Those rules do not apply to stresses. Stresses have an area associated with force on the stress element. So it's important to be aware of that and we'll see that as we go forward. Another concept to be aware of is that stress doesn't really exist at a point. It's a limit. It's a limit of the normal force divided by the area as this stress cube which is taken out as some solid body As this cube gets infinitesimally small, we can take the force on the face and the area of the face and apply this limit. As that limit goes to zero, that is the definition of normal stress. We can do the same thing with these shearing forces on a face and apply a similar definition and end up with shear stress. The going is going to get tougher as we go forward, but thanks for hanging in. See you next time.